So this is part three, practical tips and practical cases for diastology. Okay, some other tips on diastolic dysfunction. So, um, early rapid filling atrial kick, what am I gonna say on this slide? Oh, L velocity, yeah. So sometimes you'll get this, what's called this L velocity during mid-diastole. As you'll recall, mid-diastole is also called diastasis. So during diastasis, you may still have flow. And when do you think you might see that? When you have high left atrial pressure, exactly. So an L velocity represents continuous flow during diastasis. And it's usually seen in high left atrial pressure states. Usually only seen though in bradycardic states. So we don't have a lot of those patients in the ICU, at least in my ICU. A lot of them are not so bradycardic. Um, I maybe have seen this once or twice, um, but you do sometimes get continuous flow during diastole and that is uh, just due to significantly elevated left atrial pressure. Okay, I don't know about you, but I certainly have a lot of ICU patients with AFib and the question is what to do with them because they only have E velocity. So how can I figure out what the diastolic function is? Well, you could just cop out and say, hey, it's AFib, they have to have diastolic dysfunction. But that doesn't help me if I want to know my left atrial pressure because not everybody with left uh, with uh, AFib at that moment in time when you're managing them has significantly elevated left atrial pressures. So when I have AFib patients, I'm going to have highly variable E velocities because of the irregularly irregular rhythm. So how can I figure out what my E to E prime is? Well, before I even do that, I can look at the isovolumic relaxation time. As we talked about before, that's only seen in, uh, that shortens the, the worse my grade of diastolic dysfunction is. So if I have grade three or grade four diastolic dysfunction, um, I can look at my isovolumic relaxation time and if it's really low, which is less than 65 milliseconds, that might tell me my left atrial pressure is high. The other trick is I can try to get a time interval to match my E and E prime. So the beats for most patients in AFib are not so erratic that your heart rate is jumping from 50 to 170 in any you know one minute span. Most of the time you're dealing with beats that are irregular but occurring somewhat regularly. So you can probably find a in time interval that would match on your, uh, you know, your pulse wave mitral inflow velocities and your tissue Doppler velocities. So if this was like, you know, 800 milliseconds between E1 and E2, and then this is about 760 milliseconds between E prime one and E prime two, well, I could probably use the ratio of E2 to E prime two because it's about the same amount of diastolic filling time. And in fact, this is pretty well uh, established with the ASC guidelines. If you use the septal E to E prime greater than 11, in patients with AFib that use similar intervals, time intervals to compare the E to E prime, you're using a pretty good marker of left atrial hypertension. As I mentioned before, I don't know about you, I also deal with a lot of patients with RV failure and sometimes it's out of proportion to their left ventricular failure. Um, so you might say, well, how do I figure out what the, uh, what the deal is with my RV failure? We can actually look at diastolic function and determine to some degree whether or not the RV failure <coughs> is due to left ventricular disease or is due to just pulmonary hypertension. So how do I do that? If I have a very low E prime velocity, so what I need to do is look at my both septal E prime velocity and my lateral E prime velocity um, in patients with RV failure. So if I have somebody who's got a septal E prime velocity that's very low, but my lateral E to E prime is normal, that tells me that the RV failure is not really due to left atrial hypertension. However, if both E to E prime velocities, my septal and my lateral are high, then I'm really dealing with right ventricular failure, probably mostly due to my left ventricular failure. And this is a patient, I had to turn their uh, peristernal long axis sideways in a funny video here, but uh, this gives you a little bit of an idea of what I'm talking about. Um, you may not completely be able to appreciate this, but this patient has very little septal movement. So when I measured her, um, if I were to measure her septal E prime velocity, it's not going to be very much. Now this woman actually, I think, as I recall, actually had significant left ventricular diastolic dysfunction as well. So you actually can see her lateral E prime velocity um, is going to be pretty diminished as well. So this patient had a huge RV, which you can't necessarily appreciate from this, uh, this personal long axis view that's turned on its side, um, although you are seeing some paradoxical septal movement. So the question is, is it RV failure, primary pulmonary hypertension, you know, you know, groups one or three or other things like that, or is it group two disease? And this woman, I think we could say it's probably some degree of group two disease because if, when I measure my lateral and my step lead prime velocities, they're both gonna be quite low. All right, there's some stuff that an intensivist probably shouldn't touch or think about or think about too much and just get a cardiologist to help out. Um, so these are some of the things that I think are a little bit beyond the diastolic exam of the intensivist. Um, whether or not this is restrictive versus constrictive disease 
Actually, constrictive disease isn't as complicated uh, as it needs to be. Um, it's very difficult to diagnose, as you recognize, but there are actually some nice echocardiographic parameters that can help you identify constriction. Uh, but we're not going to be able to talk about that here. And if you really want to read about that, go read about it. Um, the hypertrophs, that's, again, you know, some of this diastolic stuff gets really wacky in those patients. So you may want to have a real echo done, quote, unquote, a real echo. These are all real echoes that I do as well. But a cardiologist interpreted echo in that situation. Um, if you have significant mitral disease, particularly stenosis, you might imagine your E and A velocities are going to be kind of screwed up. So if there's significant mitral stenosis, again, having a cardiologist interpret those echocardiographic parameters probably is in your best interest. Uh, we can't do strain on the machines that I have in the ICU, so I don't know if you can, but uh, I don't know much about diastolic strain. And then pulmonary venous velocity flow patterns are just, it's fascinating physiology, and I've actually learned it before. I've already forgotten it, but um, that, that's really only done through a TEE. So it's super interesting physiology, how pulmonary venous flow changes throughout diastolic dysfunction, but it's kind of beyond my scope. So we're not going to touch on that here. So we're just going to go through some cases now using simple diastolic parameters and how can we use this information to help manage your patients. So here's a patient that had post-op respiratory failure. Um, I don't have on here, but she was 70-some years old. And a uh, nurse practitioner extubates this patient. Uh, and she starts to go into respiratory distress about 30 minutes after extubation. Why is that? Well, I kind of knew why. I had some diastolic... Uh, I had some diagnostic hypotheses, but then when I threw the probe on her, I had a pretty good understanding right away. So what do I see here? Let's actually measure. So we have an E prime velocity, I'm sorry, E velocity of up to 138 and an A velocity of 165. If you don't know these velocities very well, these velocities are absolutely through the roof. So the reason this woman went into respiratory failure is because she has diastolic, severe diastolic dysfunction, right? So I don't even need to... Uh, do any other stuff. I, I could. I Actually, this machine I was on did not have tissue Doppler enabled. So I was stuck just looking at mitral inflow velocities. Um, so I couldn't get my E prime. But I can tell here my E to A is uh, a, less than 0.8 or just about 0.8. So this woman probably has grade 2 diastolic dysfunction. You can actually look at these curves all over the place. E, A, E, large A. So she has very large A waves. So she has grade 2 diastolic dysfunction. And these E velocities, even her E prime is 10, which for a 71-year-old woman would be pretty decent her E to E prime is going to be over 13. You'll also notice that there are widely variable E velocities. And any idea why that would be? These are just huge pressure, intrathoracic pressure swings from her worker breathing. So she was really huffing and puffing. Um, and as you can see, there's marked variation in the mitral inflow velocities. So you might see this in something like tamponade, but you also could just see this in somebody who has severe uh, elevations of worker breathing and very marked swings in intrathoracic pressure. So that's why that that's what this is all about. So this is a beautiful physiologic um, and clinical correlate, uh, and we can see what's happening at the level of the uh, mitral uh, blood flow and help make sense of the situation pretty quickly. So what do we do? We put her on some CPAP, diurester, and she did markedly uh, better in the next next couple hours. So I didn't have to reintubate her. Uh, just did a quick echo and figured it out. All right. So interestingly, down the hall, uh, this was actually the same day, I had a patient who uh, was admitted with hypoxemia and anasarca, and I, you know, on exam, she had this harsh systolic murmur, and I think she had, had a known history of aortic stenosis. Um, so I'm like, well, I just kind of want to see what her filling pressures are. I know what they're going to be, but this is for fun, right? We all want to like get better at this stuff too. So does this 89-year-old woman with a harsh systolic murmur have diastolic dysfunction? And again, the answer is going to be almost certainly. So this machine didn't have the tissue Doppler, but I'm getting E velocities of 141 and A velocities of 152. These are through the roof. So again, even if my E prime velocity is anywhere near a normal for an elderly person, 10, 11, this E to E prime is going to be through the roof. And I just have, this velocities are just way too high to not be diastolic dysfunction. All right, now here's an interesting case. This is a 56-year-old woman with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. Um, probably actually had uh, amyloidosis, I think. EF, really low, uh, presented with acrocyanosis, lactic acidosis, and anasarca. Um, cold everywhere, mottled feet, clearly was in a low cardiac output state. So what's her left atrial pressure? Well, first we got our uh, inflow velocities. And sorry, this next slide is going to be duplicate, so I'm going to just show it again. Uh, she gets intubated for hypoxemic respiratory failure. And these are the velocities we get. We get an E velocity of 30 an A velocity 59, so the E to A ratio is 0.52. So what grade diastolic function is that? Probably grade 2. Probably grade 2, but probably going to be worse. So here's a situation where these, this stuff kind of falls apart. So I get an, uh, you know, 
tissue Doppler of the um, lateral E prime, and I'm getting an E prime of four. Now, some of them are certainly lower, uh, but this is this was like the heart was barely moving. I get an E prime velocity value of four, but then my E, e prime is only seven because my E velocity was only 30. So is my left atrial pressure normal? And the answer here is no. So remember my E and my A are both pressure and flow dependent. So when we, we talk about these E and A velocities, mostly we think about pull and push forces and we think about pressure gradients, but it's also flow dependent. So this put woman's cardiac index, cardiac index was 0.9. Uh, so it was like in the toilet. Um, so she was in a low flow state. So I just interpreted all this in clinical context. So even though my E to E prime velocity here was seven or eight or something, this woman absolutely needed to be diureced. And actually, if you see here on her echo, there's a large pericardial, there's a pericardial effusion, a large pleural effusion. Woman was anisarchic, needs to be diureced. Okay, here's another good example. So this patient had hypoxemia and B lines, B lines everywhere. This was a patient uh, with um, some sort of underlying rheumatologic disorder that got intubated for what was either ARDS or flash pulmonary edema. And we had to use the, we used this little bit of information to help us out. So what do we see here? Well, I don't even need to measure my E velocities, although I did, but if I measure my E prime, I can see here that my relaxation is extremely vigorous. So my E prime velocities here were at least negative 16. They're off the charts. Now there's some artifact here. Um, that it is overgained. I'm sorry I did this. This was actually my own scan. I can't blame the fellow here. Uh, this was totally overgained. But you can see that my, here's one that's not overgained. My E prime velocity here is at least negative 16 or 16 centimeters per second in absolute value. So my diastolic function is probably normal. So this patient's E and A velocity is actually quite high. Uh, 90 was his E velocity. Uh, but his E to E prime was pretty normal. So this patient actually probably had normal left atrial pressure. Um, does that mean he didn't need to be diuresed? No, he just had a lot of leaky uh, capillaries and lung water from an inflammatory state and not from heart failure per se. So that was helpful uh, for understanding his phy physiology as well. Okay, here is another patient. This patient looks like they have uh, just mitral inflow velocities measured. This is probably a fellow doing this garbage. Look where this, 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 this is actually probably me to be honest, I'll confess. But look where this, this, this is not even in the right spot. So what is this patient's diastolic function? And the answer is, I don't know. I think the teaching point here is this patient doesn't really have any A waves, right? So is it, maybe this patient's an AFib or um, we just have the, the box in the wrong spot here. So I, I can't figure this out. There's nothing to be said about this. You can't create diastolic dysfunction by junky images with just E waves. Okay, how about this patient's diastolic dysfunction? So we're going to put your skills to the test. We're not measuring mitral inflow velocities. Now we're just going to eyeball diastolic dysfunction. So what do you think here? So if I look at my lateral, uh, where I would put my probe, or my, my uh, sample box for my pulse wave Doppler, lateral wall, it's just personal long axis, so infrared lateral wall. Is there much movement here? If I focus on just that spot, right by the coronary sinus here? No, there's not. So if I was gonna measure this uh, with tissue Doppler, I would see that the E prime velocity is quite low, but I actually can train my eye here to see that there's almost no movement back and forth of this myocardium. So diastolic dysfunction here is very bad. And again, this is that same patient I already I was talking about. Probably has some amyloidosis, really thick LV, really bad diastolic function, trace pericardial effusion, marked fluid overload. Their RV is big. Their coronary sinus is huge. There's a left pleural effusion. You can see the pericardial effusion all around. So ser serious diastolic dysfunction. I don't need to measure that at this point if I don't want to. But again, because I like doing the stuff I did, and that hers is the one that had a lateral E prime of four at best. Okay, now how about this one? This is maybe a little tougher. Not everybody's got great windows. So from this person along axis, can I say anything about diastolic function? For this patient, I'd say probably not. You can see that there's some movement of the mitral uh, annulus here. Uh, the myocardium seems to be rocking back and forth. Uh, but I can't tell how fast that's going. It's not super vigorous. It's not not moving like the last person's. So this one I have to throw a, a tissue Doppler on. And I can see here when I get my lateral E prime, I'm right at the edge of normal, right? Nine, a little lowish. So there's probably some diastolic dysfunction, but that would have been difficult to pick up quantitatively or qualitatively. So I have to do it quantitatively. Okay, diastolic function. This is the part three of three lectures. So I'm gonna give you some take home here, uh, take home message at the end. There's really only two big take homes. 
Um, first, in my opinion, the best use of diastology in the ICU is clearly for estimating left atrial pressure. And the easiest way to do that is just your lateral E to E prime plus four. Helpful references for normal follow a simple rule of 10. So a normal lateral E prime is greater than 10. And a normal lateral E to E prime ratio is less than 10. These are the only two things I remember all the time. The other stuff I kind of have to look up sometimes. I know the septal is a little lower at seven. I mean, I'm doing a lecture now, so that's why I remember it. But these are the two easiest numbers to remember in the ICU, as well as the simple formula. But then, of course, recognize limits of any measurement and interpret things in context. So when you get an E to E prime ratio that's less than 10, but the patient's anosarcic, they still probably need diuresis, right? Or if they have very significantly depressed systolic function and diastolic function, there's low flow, these things may not necessarily be as abnormal as you think. So um, always recognize that there are limitations even to these echo measurements. And hopefully all this was helpful.